Hey everyone, I'm Rod Roddenberry, and you're listening to Trek FM. Hello and welcome to Stage 9, Trek FM show about the people who make Star Trek. I'm Mike. I'm John. And today we have a very special guest, Larry Nemechek. And he will be joining us in a little bit to discuss Jonathan Frakes' work as a director. But before we get into that, um, let's talk about uh, Discovery and more casting news. More casting, more peoples. For uh, Star Trek Discovery. Three more people. M- Malik Pencholi is confirmed now, which I think we all knew already. Mm-hmm. And then he's going to be playing a, a, the doctor of the Shenzhou, right? Yes. Then yeah. we've got Terry Serpico, who's going to be playing a Starfleet admiral. And uh, let me see. This is they, they always have they always have one name. Bartholomeos. Okay, there you go, Sam. That, I'm I'm locking in on that one, Sam <laughs> okay. Bartholomeos. Okay, I'm going to call him Sam. Um, yes. He's going to play an ensign on the Shenzhou, who's out of Starfleet Academy, or at, is they say at an ensign from Starfleet Academy. I don't know. You know, I, yeah. I, I don't know how how accurate he's some a of junior these. officer. Yes, and yeah. you know, here's the thing about this, right? The thing which which I think is is really kind of crazy is like we really haven't been introduced to many crew members on discovery itself right or have we i mean yeah are they gonna do i mean you you were you were talking about this off mic maybe there's a uh, a voyager thing going on where right something bad happens discovery gets in the mix and uh they got to figure out what happened and that's where the klingons come into the time you know into the storyline is they got to work together because they got to figure out what happened in the shenzhou Mm-hmm. And maybe somebody from the Shenzhou is, you know, going to be coming over, and you know, I, 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 I sense that something's going to happen to the Shenzhou just with all of this, and at least one of these people is going to wind up on the Discovery because otherwise, I don't know if they would tell us their names. It so, seems unless they tell the Shenzhou story in like flashback as they're. You or know, tracking things down or something. Or this is some sort of massive, you know, um, longest day type of series, which has like right. 15,000 plot lines going on at once. And it's like, you know, which I'm yeah. totally okay with, right? Oh, same here. Yeah. No, the more the merrier, <laughs> so far as that's concerned. Whatever it is, it's going to be crazy. And, uh, and I'm excited. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, it's always good to get, uh, you know, Star Trek in the news is a good thing. There's nothing necessarily splashy um, with casting news like this, but it's something. It's mm-hmm. it's signs of, of progress and building towards something that's exciting. Yeah, yeah. So it, 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 it it's it's cool. I'm excited. I, I'm, you know, the more I hear about, uh, you know, the people who are coming involved, the more excited I get. It seems like a very... Um, diverse cast, but yeah, so so it's exciting, yeah. And hey, hey, there's gonna be Klingons. We we saw some Klingons online. That's cool, yeah. right? And there was a very spirited debate about that, about you know the Klingons, quote unquote, not looking right. It's like you know they change every so. I mean, Worf's head changed how many times <laughs> just in Next Generation for Pete's sake? Let's yeah. just all say their heads evolve. Done. See, we're, we're out. I'm, we got I'm okay it. with that. I mean, on yeah. the long list of things I'm worried about with this show, how the Klingons look is pretty much at the very bottom. I have to well, say. I mean, why? Why would it be? Why would it be also uh, out of out of the realm of possibility that there would be variants among the Klingons? Yeah, you know, like maybe there's somebody from the southern end of Kronos that looks a little different or something like that. Well, you know, yeah, I, you know, I'm down with that too. Sure, why not? Why not? Yeah. All right. Um, well, okay, just one other thing that, that I want to mention, not related to Discovery yeah. in terms of the news. They started up the Kickstarter thing or the Indiegogo thing for this uh, this Deep Space Nine documentary, which yeah. Iris Stephen Bear has been working on for like five years now, called yeah. uh, What We What We Left Behind. And yes. um, they, they hit their, their goal in the first day. Uh, they've hit their second stretch goal now, which means they're only a hundred thousand dollars away from hitting the second stretch goal, which means 
expanded writer's room segment. So Which come on, exciting. guys. Yes, let's yeah. make this happen because you know what? Uh, I, well, there is obviously a uh, hunger for more Deep Space Nine behind the scenes stuff. You know, I mean, for them to make their their initial goal in a day, that's there's definitely uh, some interest out there, I'd say. For sure. And there's that, yeah. that one like shot in that, that little teaser thing where mm. you see like yeah. Ron Moore talking about how they're going to get like Cisco back on the station. I'm like, oh my God, is this heaven? <laughs> yep. Oh my God, I can't <laughs> wait. This is easily the, my, my most anticipated film of 2018 right now. So yeah, uh, head on over to their, their Indiegogo thing and check that out. Okay, well, should we get into our our feature presentation for today yes feature presentation <laughs> and now, now for... our feature presentation <laughs> hey it's larry nemechek how's it going larry it's going good it's going good it was very hard for me to i was trying to stay out of your your discovery discussion there but uh no see you shouldn't have stayed out we want your take we've got we are you well, know yes i was expecting like an iron curtain ribbed like airlock door here between the segments and we just kind of <laughs> oozed we just kind of did an odo under the door there and just oozed in so you know, it's it, anything goes here on stage nine you, you've been That's on right. stage nine or whatever I, number it is I these have, days. or paramount uh, 31 or 30 whatever the hell it is yeah whatever it is uh, yeah unless it's new you, stage nine which is stage nine. um no no not not that one no we were, oh, we're on the, the real one stage and then there's the stage here. nine yeah. it continues sets but uh, which is what the sets have been christened did you know that oh yeah, I want to go I, there so bad. Because when I first saw your name changed, I thought, now, I don't know. This is going to be a podcast all about continues? That was <laughs> that was different, but okay. Uh, it could just about yeah. support one, but... Uh, Pretty much, yeah. yeah. But... But no, yeah. So, th- <laughs> welcome to the show. You you haven't you haven't been on our our new show yet, which is kind of weird. I but... haven't, but I can still smell the new paint smell. It's great in here, and uh... yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're. Uh... We're we're still moving the bigger uh, set pieces in. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I love what you've done with the right. fireplace. That's nice. And uh... <laughs> <laughs> it was an important innovation. Yeah, right, yeah. right next to the helm console. So it's uh, it's all good. Yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to say real real quick that uh, all the spec. Yeah, you're when you said about Discovery being in the news and that's the best thing ever. It is. Um, and, I mean, I can't wait for Star Trek to – I've said this a million times. I can't wait for Star Trek to break through as this 13-part all-access new new universe, new paradigm of production, you know, called the streaming channels and the premium channels and all that. And for Star Trek to finally jump into that and for it to be, be some little um, cult, not to the fandom but to the mainstream, some cult show that breaks through and every fourth person at all the Comic-Cons next year is wearing some obscure – you know, our hero costume that's really distinctive from Discovery. That would be the awesomest thing ever. But I'll be happy with less. I'm happy with a good show. But I'm, I have this little fantasy in my mind that that, yeah. you know, you know. Well, we'll make the uh, everybody, every fourth person dressing up as the stretch goal. <laughs> and our, our, our initial goal is just a good show. Well, the, the DS9 <laughs> documentary, th- I mean, I had no doubts, but the fact they made their goal in, in one or whatever, one or two days was just incredible. I, hadn't even, I was going to call up Ira to do an interview or something, and I, only had to, I love it when the, uh, when the Kickstarter campaigns zoom ahead of anything anybody can do from the outside. That's a, that's a lovely – that's a great sign. That's a great sign. But Discovery, I think, is going yeah. to be the storytelling, partly because it was Brian creating it, dreaming it up, and partly because it's just freaking 2017, and that's where TV is cutting edge tv i think it'll be i i don't know about you know millions of ships and crews but um i think it'll be it won't it's not a 26 episode run at seven years we need a standing crew that things happen to you know they go and that drives all the action and over time we get maybe five or ten or fifteen recurring characters this is a big splash debut limited season returning seasons but it's it'll be like an epic, it'll be like an epic movie. It'll be it'll be like Game of Thrones or The Sopranos or whatever, where you've got, you definitely have your regulars, but you've got a whole fleshed out cast, and everybody will be proud to be a part of it. And if that means two ships and a Klingon ship and a base, and you know, I mean, it's not going to be limited like where does our hero ship go every episode? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So that doesn't this doesn't yeah. surprise me. I mean, it is. 
it in the beginning it is okay now is that on the Shinzu is that on Discovery? I mean, you know, he's the he's the yeah. second assistant janitor prop guy. Okay, wh- is which show is which ship is he on? <laughs> That'll be a little <laughs> dicey in the beginning, but uh, yeah, and and I love the fact that we finally come to the era of the leaks. So, yep, yeah, this yeah. this this show has been rather. Or I, well, maybe it hasn't. Maybe it hasn't been any it's, leakier than any other production. It's just that people are paying attention. I don't know. I think it's been relative. I mean, there's just been one or two that get a real high profile. No, it hasn't been. It hasn't been. Yeah. It's not near yeah. as leaky as Trump's White House, but <laughs> <laughs> but true. Um, true. But it's just been enough to make everybody go. And you know. So anyway, we this that's not our theme tonight, so we shouldn't keep talking about it. But uh, it's fun to watch this and to know that oh my god, it won't premiere for another four or five or six months. So. Look out, leak. Yeah, yeah. Look Who out, more when? leaks. And you know, when? CBS still hasn't confirmed that. Yeah. Um, uh, what's her name? Shaniqua? Shaniqua. Shaniqua. Martin yeah, Green. they've still not yeah. officially confirmed that because they're going by the official PR playbook of announcements. So, yeah, yeah. Which oh, means, I mean, I'm guessing yeah. that when she's announced, there's going to be another wave of you know people like her, like her captain. You know, I mean, we still don't know mm-hmm. the the captain of Discovery, right? So, so yeah. Unless there isn't cool. one, and she's like the acting captain, and they've done all that to fool you. No, she's not con. Dun, dun, dun. No, not at all. Just... Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, I that don't one know. left deep scars for all of us, Larry. <laughs> <laughs> that was definitely, oof. Oh, yeah, well. <laughs> so, okay, so today we're going to be talking about something which is kind of inspired by some, you know, speculation regarding Discovery, and, and that is Jonathan Frakes as a director and his his work in Star Trek and, and outside of Star Trek, but primarily inside of Star Trek, because um, it's a very sort of unique story, and, and in a lot of ways that he's probably the the most famous director of of the next generation era and uh the stuff that he's done has been really good you know starting all the way back in season three of next gen with the offspring and going into the movies with first contact and insurrection and then past the movies into a a a career which which he's he's been able to to maintain for uh, what like 20 years now right which is is really impressive. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's like his thing. He's not even really an actor anymore, so much as he is a director, and that's really cool. So, um, yeah, figured bring on Larry, talk about some 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 freaks, and and uh, see see where this goes. So, okay, <laughs> he 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 got his start. Everyone knows that he like went to the directing school. You know, he was kind of the pioneer in in that regard. Um, but, you know, I mean, you do hear about actors on TV shows directing, you know, ep- episodes of their shows every once in a while. I mean, you know, uh, Shatner directed episodes of T.J. Hooker. He was going to do an episode of, of the original series, apparently, if it if it hadn't ended as quickly as it had. And I- I'm guessing that that's a fairly common thing, but it seemed to be like a really big deal on next gen like this isn't something that Berman was just going to hand to people they had to work for it so what was what was the uh the reasoning behind that yeah well the show had settled in uh the first two years were so chaotic as we all has and now is out in public but um uh, you know the chaos in the bridge documentary but yeah Jonathan yeah. had had wanted that i think he was by that time how do I say this? I think he knew, just like Robin McNeil, that he had loved acting, but in college and all that, um, you know, they if they had <laughs> they the guys that have a look about them know that they won't always have that look their whole life, and if part of that is their casting mm-hmm. appeal, not to get you know weird about it, but it's the same thing happens to women. <laughs> In fact, it's a good. It's just a good security thing in Hollywood. Basically, any actor knows that if they're hot when they're eighteen and twenty and twenty-two and twenty-five, first, first, all you concentrate on is just getting work, right? And if you can get, if you can break through to being past a working actor to where you're a known working actor, and then you're a type and a known, and you're cast. Heaven forbid, you're like a constant that guy we always see or that woman we always see. We can't remember their name. And then if you ever like really get a break and you're a lead in a hit show or you break through in a movie, that's awesome. And then you know every time the challenge and your paranoia shifts from um, you know can I not starve 
to can I keep doing this without having to have a day job to can I, oh, now I'm a hit. Now can I keep up or will I be a one hit wonder? And then it, then eventually if you're working regularly or if you're, a, you know, A, if you're a huge iconic kick like you played Riker on Next Generation, your first worry is will I be stereotyped like the original cast all felt like they were and always were fighting against until they just gave up and became icons and could live off that. And then, um, uh, and then it's, uh, what's my second, what's my follow-up going to be? That's what you're paranoid about. What's my paranoid going to be to show that I wasn't just, I wasn't just, you know, Riker, that I can do something else. And that's hard for a lot of people, even the, you know, the best actors on Trek that we all love. I mean, it's not their fault. Sometimes, you know, you're a victim of your success. Like, I think maybe Brent was that way. And, I mean, in the original cast, surely Shatner and Nimoy were that way even at the beginning. They would do bits, but nothing was going to, you know, playing Paris on Mission Impossible was not going to live up to being Spock. And, um, and you know, Barbary Coast sure was no Kirk uh, for Shatner. So, I mean, that's – but this is all the creative's – mental hurdles that you get through. And if you are lucky enough, if you do get to be a Denny Crane after years of being Shatner or nothing, I mean a Kirk or nothing, then um, then you then you're you've got to a plateau, you know. And the way a lot of actors hedge that, very good actors, even the ones that become iconic, is they look around and they go, well, I, you know, what's what's not going to depend on my looks? And it's not about them and their internal confidence and their talent. The talent doesn't go away, but you're dealing in Hollywood the way you are maybe in the political realm. You're dealing with perceptions, right? And the people that have the money, the suits, the hiring people, the decision makers. And you could be the best in the world, but if there's a meme or something uh, that's running through and you're on the wrong side of the meme, then there's very little you can do about it. That's why I love the people that were big hits and then they go away and you hear they were like, you know, caught, arrested, raiding a dumpster or something, you know, 20 years later. And then 10 years go by and they're and, and they're cast in something that's a huge hit and everybody goes, oh, what a great comeback so-and-so just had, you know. It's like, well, it's not like that's – are they any less talented than they were when they were, you know, younger? So yeah. it's all about all those yeah, external yeah. things. So one of the things you do to control the externals is you go to the places where there's there's still a lot of competition, and you still have to be competent and talented, but those the cosmetic factors aren't there. A lot of actors. That's why a lot of actors do voiceover. A lot of actors go into because uh, that's the that's the craziest, wickedest, meanest realm of all of the job, and and a lot of them you know they they, be, they become producers, they become directors. And and if they're smart, they do it when they're they can leverage themselves when they're at the top of their peak, you know, as actor. Which shows how smart Jonathan and other like Roxanne and Robbie and a lot of them that go, you know, I'm not going to be twenty and sparkling my whole life. And sadly, that's where the prejudice of the money, the casting, and the pop and the public also is. So you want that dependable day job, even though it's not. You have to get hired a million. You know, you have to get hired over and over again. But you. If you show your talent and you get and you have a network of people that will probably have you back and new things are coming along all the time that are looking for that, then um, then, yeah, it's very like we talked about. A lot of people have a lot of actors have no intention of giving up acting, but they like to direct to kind of stretch their muscle. I mean, Patrick's directed. Yeah. You know, Mm -hmm. and no one's not going to think of him as a director over an actor. But uh, but yeah, so it was it's just that John of the Star Trek world. Jonathan was, the, I mean, Jim, James Darren did the same thing. When Jimmy Darren grew out of his Moondoggy years and his teen pop years in the 80s, he, he directed on T.J. Hooker, much less other things. Yeah. And he never thought he'd be back in front of a camera, really, <laughs> until, until, you know, Ira and the DS9 guys found him for, after, after Frank Snotter Jr. didn't want to do it, to be Vic. And then that, in turn, got him thinking about singing again, and he started touring for singing and in his act. So, you know, things go in cycles. But it but it's yeah. a logical thing and but Ro- Jonathan was the first one to break through and it helped that next generation finally was calming down you know with Michael there cuz the, the offspring was the first one and they they used to talk about Star Trek directing college and Rick would make him go sit with the editors and with the you know the effects guys and and see how all the parts worked. But, you know, Jonathan is a smart guy, 
partly shown by the fact that it was only the third season next gen when he was thinking about the future. So yeah. Now, I mean, like you hear him describe the the you know directing college or whatever it was, and it sounds very intense for him. And then everyone else, once he he did it, you know, everyone else kind of followed. And, you know, you, you look at sort of like when the other, you know, actors sort of like fell in place and they're kind of like one right after the other. And I kind of get the impression that... LeVar, he, LeVar is another one. Yeah, 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 yeah. He, yeah right, for sure. <laughs> but I kind of get the impression that like once he got through that door that they kind of eased up on everyone else. I mean, that's just... I, I'm I'm not basing that on anything other than just, you know you know, my, 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 my personal, uh, you know, perception of that. But I mean, do, do, would you say that that's accurate? Do you mean like, did he knock down the wall? Did he pioneer it for everybody else? Yeah. Well, well, like, like did, did Berman say like, okay, I'll let you do this, but if you do it, you're going to have to put in, you know, like a hundred hours in mm-hmm. the editing room and you're going to have to do all this stuff. That's and it, then yeah. by the time Patrick Stewart came around, he's like, okay, just sit with the editor for a day and then we'll say, you know, you're, you're, that's good enough. You know? Well, I, you know, <laughs> here, well, I mentioned LeVar. So LeVar is another one who everybody remembers. I mean, he's, he's blessed because he hits the world as Kunta Kinte and Roots. And that's, that's, uh, just a few years before Next Generation. So, because when they were, you know, when they announced, it, we were talking about Discovery a while ago and on the way modern TV and thing where they'll, on big projects, they'll like drag it out for the social media value, you know, in the old days, in the 80s and 90s <laughs> and aughts, you know, remember how they would, everybody, they would just come out and announce everybody. Here's the cast picture, you know, yeah. Next Gen did that and DS9, yeah. well, okay. And because yeah. no one cared and there was, there was only three networks and one, you know, Entertainment Tonight and News papers and magazines and nobody you know nobody needed a drip 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 but right. um when they announced the next gen cast i distinctly remember i've got the clipping it was oh next generation is headed by lavar burton of roots uh will wheaton of stand by me and this very famous british shakespearean guy who was in dune and and i claudius <laughs> yeah. and that was you know and then some other people and that was because yeah. because they didn't care about the the character billing order. They were talking about their actual you know marquee value clout. So Lavar was really lucky that he kind of got over that. Uh, you know, uh, he had Kunta, and then he transformed that into Reading Rainbow, which at the time was oh that little PBS show. But you know you you influence this whole generation that now are all running the world. So he's God to that generation, and then he's then he's uh, Jordy. So he's very blessed to do that. But even he, not knowing that Reading Rainbow would come back and we'd have social media and you could you know, do a million different platforms with it, and knowing that he was never going to be as young as Kunta again, and then he would not be as young as Jordy <laughs> again, um, yeah. and the movies were only going to go so long, that he was smart in investing in it. And he had that, you know, it's not, it's not everybody that has it. Not every actor can be a director. Or have, or be the best director, or be a functioning director that people want to keep rehiring because they they get a, they deliver a great product, and especially in television, they get the damn thing done on time and on budget, you know. And they're not a diva, and they get along with people, and they and if there's some added value there, they bring in. That's a, and that's the key thing that John. I mean, all these Trek people, whether they're infected with the inner glow of the gene <laughs> of the Roddenberry vision or not, that helps. But um, that's what that's what television directing and consistent directing uh, is all about. If you break through to features, it's like, oh, my God, what was your box office? You know, and that's how much money you'll get for the headliners. Mm-hmm. And then if you don't get those, then are you just a working features director and you go out and you do, you know, indie movies? And, you know, because there's a whole there's a whole um, uh, layer to that. There's a whole uh, what am I saying? Pecking order to that. And. We only think about the really top name, top dollar, high blockbuster uh, directors. But there's a you know there's a whole cadre of working directors that are doing you know indie projects and small budget things. So so there's that to play with, and these these guys that are really looking for the security because one thing in Hollywood you never know you know what the, nothing is sure. You're always hedging your bets, and the smart ones are the ones that stash the money away. Don't go blow it. So I, I imagine that. Um... You know, the fact that uh, he was also successful, you know, out of the gate helped a lot, too. 
Like if he if he had cut if he had gone through all of the training and everything, and then he does an episode and it goes sideways, that probably locks everybody else out for a while. Or you know, possibly Berman just says, "No, no, no, we're good, we're good. We we, we don't need to try this again." So you know, it, I, I would just imagine that 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 natural talent that he has was you know, it's good that he was one of the first through the door. Well, uh, so that well, yeah, and the other big thing else. about Jonathan, and again, we're talking about the little world of, of Next Generation, and as you guys know, and as we talk about on Portal 47, all the audience sees is that finished product, and we see a fraction of the names on screen. There's this whole community of 150 people, some of them not all are together. There's the stage bunch, there's the people in the offices, sometimes there's overlap, there's all the post people that may not ever see anybody in the, in the stages in the offices, but... That that fam. There are some people that do have to make the rounds, like you know the executive and TV. The executive producer Rick Berman has to do that, or the showrunners have to do that, and the dire- the show directors to some extent are way beyond that. So too, but it starts with the stage, and that's the daily group of people who are you know union guys and gals, and they get up and people are in at four in the morning, and sometimes they may be there till midnight and. You're balancing all these crews and you're doing actors and everybody with their little, on one hand, their little inherent, um, you know, pecking order leads, regular cast, guest actors, you know, uh, director, director of photography, design heads when they come in, crew heads, crew guys, stand in stunt people that if you, you know, you sneeze or you leak a picture of the Klingons. Uh, you know, your your name is Toast, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and uh, see how I just we keep, it's all, it all waves together, guys, it all waves together. But, uh, <laughs> but, you know, you've got that hierarchy spread, and for someone to be able to, uh, you know, get the job done, get the job done well, and endear themselves to so many, I mean, that was basically Jonathan's thing. He was talented, he had a, he was an actor, he knew entertainment, he knew the human condition, he knew how to make a story work on film. Uh, especially after he went through Star Trek school for directors, but he the 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 gleam in his eye, and his ability to, and and all the actors talk about this. I was just rereading some of Jerry Flex, his, the assistant great assistant director that died suddenly, sadly during in his sleep during Enterprise, but had been around and was Jonathan's AD for his two movies, was talking about that talent that Jonathan had. That at least in the Star Trek world, and probably everywhere else he's gone, where he's become a regular director, because a lot of the shows he's done since then, he's directed several episodes of. So you can see that it's appreciated there, even if it's not the thing he was birthed in. Like, oh, I was in the cast, and I knew everybody already, and now we're just, you know, we get along so well. But um, it's that ability to make everybody feel good, have a good time, where people didn't dread coming to work, which you know is should be true of any job, any. Any good boss or manager, you you pray to have that kind of a person in your workspace, not the ones that's there's the you know there's the dreary extreme, and then there's the ones that are just everybody just shows up and ha ha ha, and I talk to you at the company picnic once a year, and you know you don't know I'm alive. And apparently, uh, from what everybody says, Jonathan had that extra. That was the icing on the cake for Jonathan. So if there was anything that kind of helped push it along at the beginning. Maybe even something you had to overcome at the beginning, you know, like, oh, yeah, you're all smile and laugh, Jonathan, but can you get the work done? And I think once he proved that, that, yeah, I can not only send everybody home smiling, I, I can actually get it done. It looks decent, you know, which the offspring, you know, obviously did. Um, helps having a great, you know, and then when they're looking for that, when they decide to give somebody a chance, A, they obviously need a script that doesn't have them involved much. So there's the one great scene with Riker and, you know, Lal and Offspring where he gives her a smack. So he got a great, <laughs> or she gives him a smack. So we got a great moment, but it was one, you know. He's not even, you yeah. know, he's hanging around the outside. Because you don't want to wear the space, they, as they would say, you don't want to have to wear that space suit when you're, the rest of the day you're directing. Um, you know, so <laughs> it's like, it's like Leonard directing four when he could wear the band and not have to put the ears on in the morning, you know. Um right. Yeah, but that yeah. I mean that's so that's in Jonathan's specific case. I think that's what all was going on. And yeah, you're right. But the thing is, they try to find a crucible. They find a test case <laughs> where they're going to ensure him success. So all that crew that he gets along with, the last thing they want, everybody wants to make it work for Jonathan. He probably even gets a little extra out of all the different, all the grips and the crews and the gaffers and the camera crew and the extras. They're probably all rooting for him because they like him so much, you know. And so that helps too. When you come from that, you know, not that that's a requirement, yeah. but it's sure a bonus when you're there. And 
And then on the producer's side, they're going to make, they know that they've got excellent support. You know, they know that uh, Marvin Rush is going to back him up with his camera crew and, and, and whoever it was, Rob or Dan's visual effects crew at the time, you know, line was going to back him up on the post side. I mean, they know that everybody's going to be a supportive group for one of their baby taking their first, you know, their first flight. And that's the beauty. That's the beauty of of learning yeah. it coming out of the crucible of the group that you're part of. You know, like a cast member coming out there. Same thing would be like for first ads, mm. especially who are who are going to direct. You know, and then David Livingston was a line producer. Was a was a yeah line producer was a unit production manager and did the budgets. You know, and he wanted to direct, and uh, he got his chance. Yeah, he directed and, um, like more episodes than almost anyone in Star Trek. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, late night Livingston. Even though he had that, even though he had that, uh, you know, it's like, oh, great, David, you're like telling us no, 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 when we want something extra for our shows because of budget, and then when you get to direct, it's like what a blank check. You know? <laughs> but yeah, they they even, all have these nicknames, isn't it? Two takes freaks, wasn't that that his? Uh, his yeah, nickname? see, yeah. he's he's efficient. Yeah, <laughs> two takes freaks, late night Livingston. Yeah, there's a there's a really funny picture from Enterprise where they've got a clock. I think it's 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 Jonathan and it's. Um, Suzanne Westmore, one of the makeup people, and David and somebody else, and they've got a clock face, and it's like, you know, like eleven twenty or something, and they're all pointing at it like, look, look, David actually got out before me. It's kind of, <laughs> it's kind of fun. Yeah. But those were those are the things that are all in play when somebody like Jonathan, and so like he's the best test case, and when he does get a shot, they you know the the script has to fit, and um and look look Offspring was a was a vehicle for. For Brent, how can you go wrong with Brent, and uh, and a great and a great uh, data story with you know uh, data involved. I mean, with the Picard involved and all that. So it's like they the the sh- they find the sure thing on everything. The sure thing with the crew. The sure thing with the story and the situation to get them launched well because they want them to succeed. It's not like ah, we're going to make you fail so these damn actors will never raise up and dare to ask to direct again. I mean, that's not what it's about, you know. So right. And yeah, then they, yeah, once he once he did knock that wall down, then Lavar came along and 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 you know, poor Gates though. We'll talk about how she thought all the boys got to direct, and they finally gave her one show, and she did a great job with it. Yeah, yeah, I, I heard her talking about that um, last year uh, at at the the fiftieth anniversary convention. How she was saying that, like she was the only one who had experience, and she mm-hmm. expressed interest in doing it early on, but was you know shut out. You know, and came from a end. theater, big time theater background, stage yeah. background. Yeah, yeah. So that's unfortunate, but yeah. So okay, you know, the, the, he 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 does Offspring. He gets a mm-hmm. few more episodes, pretty big one, like Cause and Effect. Even I was going to say, yeah. You know, um, and eventually, you know, here well, we get. Well, let's the... let's say them real fast. Offspring okay. reunion. The Drumhead, which was a little tiny bottle show, but very powerful. And it's all about uh, witch hunting and McCarthyism. Gosh. Right. How relevant right. again. Uh, but no, then Cause and Effect, which as a director and a cast was like hell to keep up with to shoot. <laughs> Just, you know, as a point while you're shooting it live. Now, which one is this? What? What? How many? <laughs> I've done it five times. Which way? You know, that comes <laughs> off beautifully. And then Quality of Life, yeah. The Chase, which was fun, attached. And... Um, which was, you know, Big Patrick and Gates, and then Sub Rosa, which everybody loves to now go, oh, my God. But I was just reading uh, Jerry Taylor's notes. She was talking about how she, you know, it was her story. She loved gothic romance. She tried to have Janeway's hologram be the gothic, you know, novel. Um, but uh, she was talking about how she loved Sub Rosa, and she thought Jonathan did a great job and had a complete feel for the time and the place and, you know, all that. And But then he gets to go over and direct on DS9, and, and I think that's where... Those were leading up to the search part two with the effect. When they could see that it was a TV guy who could deal with effects, that was the big thing. Can you deal with some yeah, scope yeah. and complexity? If we're leading into his first directing gig, which was First Contact, yeah, then who are they going to give the who are they going to give it to? Yeah, Search Part Two, which was um, it was like the basically the second half of the season two premiere, right? And then, yeah. no, season three premiere, right. season and three. then. And then Past Tense Part Two, which is, you know, one of the best episodes of the series, and mm-hmm. then yeah, he gets he gets the gig on on First Contact, which is huge. Now, I mean, I I, I read the fifty year mission thing, and you know they were talking about how, you know, 
things didn't necessarily go as well as they had hoped with generations in terms of, you know, David Carson and all that stuff. And they were looking for someone and, you know, various people who you would kind of would kind of jump to mind, like like, uh, you know, Colby and stuff like that were nixed for various reasons. Yeah. And then they landed on Frakes. But like it seems like there would be a lot of people in between, you know, Carson and and Fra- like until you get to Frakes, you know what I mean? What what was it about Frakes that pushed his name to the top of that list? I th- well, I think because um, he talked about how all the guys put their names in, and uh, a lot of the TV because they were they were trying to you know was it, to start with he was kidding somewhere about how uh, yeah well once they got past. You know all the big, some big name directors. He's laughing because they're not going to spend that money on a on a Trek movie. At least back at that time, you know the 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 business model for a Trek movie was what will the fan base bring in? Now go you know twenty percent beyond ten percent beyond that. <laughs> um, but once they you know didn't go for Steven Spielberg, uh, they were looking at their better TV. And he said I had to throw my hat in the ring uh, with everybody else. But they, I think, for some of the qualities we talked about. That they thought, um, and he had proven himself dealing with visual effects, and I think a couple of those had a little bit of scope to them, even for for TV episodes. So oh, yeah, um, for sure. So yeah, and and even I think part of the thing may have been like when he did get a dog. Like, what was the reason for it being a little bit of a dog? And uh, and I was reading, I was reading back on um, like the last. TV, the last episode of Trek he directed before First Contact was uh, Prototype, <laughs> the, Vo- the yeah. Voyager robot show, which was like disappointing to everybody, including the actor who was cast to, to be all of it, and he spent the whole show behind a tin mask. And and <laughs> and somebody said uh, it's either Jerry or or one of the actors or one of the people, Brandon, I think, was talking about. Oh my God, you know. Oh, we, they were talking about uh, poor Roxanne. Have, she just spent five days talking to a guy behind a tin mask. Um, and for Jonathan to have brought that off as well as he did. So I think part of the formula there was even like, in hindsight, we go, oh, that wasn't the, you know, it was not the director's fault, but we handed them not the best script in the world, not the best situation in the world. And did they make as much lemonade out of the lemons as they could? And because yeah. uh, I think that's part of it. It's not just when everything is going great. It's when things are, you know, it's like any job. When things are not going well, how do you respond and how do you, um, how do you pick up and go? And um, so projections was another Voyager that had a lot of, that had, um, had uh, Picardo playing for the first time, playing Doc Zimmerman, and and there was a lot of you know two screen you know mirrored projection in that. So even on a TV episode. Project. And not just, oh, here's a blue screen. We're all staring at ships that are going to be put in, but the human element of visual effects, right? So um, yeah. that was yeah. a case of having to deal with humans putting up stuff and dealing with Picardo and stand-ins and, and all that. So I think I think all of that weighed in. Past tense um, and the search were both – also another thing was they were both part twos. So it's not like he went yeah. in and did the first end of a show and got to kind of go, well, huh. he had to come in and match – what had been done first and then have his own stamp on it. And past tense had, you know, big crowd scenes. He had a lot of extras to deal with there. And and some some heavy heavy subject matter as well. Right. You know, a lot of like character things, you know, with, with the actors and stuff, which I guess it makes sense right. that he would be yeah. really good at since that's you know. His and background. some of the like Rick, um I I was I remember the I talked to Rick many times, and they've been on my on speaker CDs too. And he's obviously no longer with us too. He died a couple of years ago, but uh, I remember asking him like because they talk about a, a director, and this is another thing about Jonathan. The times I talk to him, he he doesn't get off on the analytical. He keeps it pretty sitting, unless you sat down and said, "Okay, now Jonathan, look me in the <laughs> face. I want to talk about directing." And I want you to be technical, <laughs> you know. Like, oh, I, just, yeah. I mean, he can't. He obviously has to know what lenses he's doing and what he's doing, you know, and how he's going to blend this shot into blue screen or whatever. But um, he keeps the human end of it first. You t- directors talk about being, are you an actor's director or a techie's director? You know, do you care more about the camera and the shots and the angles than you do about the people and their acting? Or do you come out of stage and you're more of a... You, you, you deal with all the actors and their, you know, motivations in the scene work, and the script work, and you let the DP 
behind you deal with the, what the camera needs to be doing and what's you know and blending in with what the seed you know what the visual effects guys need and all that kind of thing on the blockbuster and he was probably good at both yeah it, it is interesting like mm -hmm. uh, and and know, i think maybe rick colby may have and just to quick that i think rick colby may have been a little bit more of a techie director and dependent on the he can go up and say hey i need more of this from you but I think yeah. he may have leaned more tech way. And I think maybe Jonathan's plus may have been that he they thought he was a good fit for both. Yeah, no, no, that's true. That's true. I mean, it, it's it's interesting, yeah. you know, what you say there, because like, he, <laughs> like I, I just keep on thinking about like uh, Frakes' commentary that he does uh, with, <laughs> with Sirtis for Insurrection. And the two of them, but, you know, Frakes in particular, who made the movie, who obviously was intimately involved with the creation of this movie, he's kind of like, I barely remember doing this. I have no idea what's going on here, you know? And that really kind of, like, spe I mean, I know, like, some of it is just for, you know, for humorous effect or whatever, but I really get the impression that in some, like, he's not, like, a hoity-toity artist who's like i am doing citizen kane you know he's just like he's not an job. he's not an auteur <laughs> exactly exactly right. you know right. he's he's doing a job and he's going to do that job exceptionally well but he's not going to be precious about it you know mm -hmm. which is probably the ideal you know personality for this job especially a job like this especially in television but then, you know, and he does kind of, like you're saying, just it's kind of like, whatever, we did this thing, it doesn't matter, who cares, this is boring. <laughs> but you you look at his movies or his TV shows or whatever, his episodes, and they are much more visually striking than your average episode. Like, he's really good at the visual thing, even though he kind of just, you know, doesn't acknowledge that side of his, his talent, really, you know? Mm -hmm. It's it's, it's interesting. Yeah, yeah, I mean do you think that that's because he didn't go to like a formal film school? Like he went in and he like, you know, he, he doesn't have any sort of dogma attached to him for how to mm -hmm. move the camera. And so he's willing to play with it and say, Oh, I, I got to do this. You know, um, you know, like to get back to like cause and effect. It's like, huh? Well, okay. I could do it this way or this way. And he's going to be more willing to sort of like break out of the mold and, and make it, he's going to be aware that, so somebody is going to need something more uh, relatable to make something like that work. Well, I think, yes. I think the fact that, and not to be blunt about this, but I think the fact that he came to directing secondarily, and I don't mean like, well, here's a pay, it's a paycheck. Because <laughs> obviously he cares. Right. And he's an artist. Yeah. He came through, he came through acting as his primary, you know, training. But you were, if you're an actor, you're always being acted by directors on stage or in front of a camera. So it's, you're not... You know, you're not like it's not like you were a farmer and you came in to be a director. But uh, I think the fact that, like you said, he didn't grow up. Oh my, he's not like like you hear. You know, directors who are techies who are obsessing over lenses and this new gadget and yeah, you know, processes and methods, and that's wonderful. But that wasn't his communication. That wasn't his language. So I think where maybe he's a plus, maybe. You know, we we haven't talked about this yet, but his first big not, you know, first contact was his first feature credit, and then Insurrection, and then when he kind of took his baby steps outside of Star Trek, and he, so he's done features, so I'm a feature director, you know, on the resume, and his first baby steps out of the Star Trek cradle into the real world and directing, like when Leonard did Three Men and a Baby, um, yeah, was Clockstoppers, I believe. And I yeah. never saw it, and I almost tried to see it before we did the show. But it was a kind of a it was a you know a kids movie. It was a time travel thing, so they thought, oh, it'll be great for it. And I know that the powers that be weren't as happy with the outcome. I think it may have been more about the box office than the content. I don't know, but for whatever reason, I, the important thing was the perception was that he, that didn't you know that didn't springboard to anything else for him. I, I saw yeah. Clock Stoppers. I mean, uh, you know, well, I was a projectionist at the time, but so I, I ran it, you know, the night before. But I was like, Clock Stoppers, yeah, Jonathan Frakes, you know, I was all excited. That and Thunderbirds. <laughs> and, you know, Clock Stoppers is, is very <laughs> solid. You know, I think like a lot of people, it was like the year after Spy Kids. And like, I remember him even talking about it. He's like, we've got the Spy Kids weekend. I think it was like uh, um, Good Friday or something like that, that it came out, you know? And I think a lot of people were like, this is going to be this year's Spy Kids. And 
Spy Kids was an anomaly. You know, it was a crazy hit. And Clockstoppers, though, it's a really solid movie. You know, I, I would definitely recommend watching Clockstoppers. It it works. It totally it totally works. But, but see again, you perception. Know. You know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, what's look at the cult movies that get rented or get downloaded or get, you know, DVR'd or Netflix all the time and you you know, the cult movies like Princess Bride, you know, or or Office Space. I mean, some of the ones that, you know, yeah. they were never big at the box office. And Clerks, no. my god, you know. But yeah. uh, the indie movies and all. So, you know, the test of time is one thing, but in the in the immediacy of people's, you know, the suits and the producers and the money people's memory, that's when you're talking about the real time having a job. But now you go yeah. back, and I was looking at his, but his credits here. So, you know, and there was a time when he, I think, felt like, okay, well, I've blown my wad. I'm a humble guy. And he went back, and he taught back home. He went to Maine. He was in New York. He was teaching in college. And then I, that, a few years went by, and then he came back to Hollywood. And that's, I know there's a video that I did on my blog when we were at the um, – Lightspeed charity thing, the first time I'd ever gone, I guess it was the first time he'd ever gone, and there's like about a four or five minute chat we have when he had just come back to L.A., he and you know, his wife Jeannie, Jeannie Francis, and, uh, and you know, they're both hot, hot, uh, known for something, her on, what, General Hospital, right? Yeah, Luke and Laura, oh my God. And then, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. and then dealing with the aging <laughs> out of that, and then when that goes away, what do you do with yourself? And the last thing you want to do is be a one-hit wonder and make yourself feel creative and, you know, much less eat <laughs> and pay rent, mm -hmm. you know. So yeah. um, finding the, the ways that careers challenge. And, you know, one thing about the last 10, 15 years of digital age is there's way, way, way more ways for people to do that. There's way more ways for everybody to do that, you know, moi included. Yeah. But, but, um, but that's a thing that's been helpful. But he was just finding his way after thinking, okay, well, Hollywood's – I'm putting words in his mouth. But there's a, there's a level yeah. of – Okay, that's it. I had a good run. Thank you. You know, I always have Star Trek conventions, but no actor wants to ever, you know, think their whole life is just going to be going to Star Trek conventions. They want to still be doing worthwhile, you know, they want to show their talent. They want to have an impact on the world. They want to do good things with their intentions. And I, at the time, he thought that was going to be teaching. And thankfully, he came back to L.A. and got into directing. And, you know, I'm just, I'm just looking here. He directed on, well, Roswell back in the day. And then, um, yeah, yeah. And then, he was like the lead director on that thing. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm seeing a, five really episodes there. He did uh, then um, the librarians. He did those TV movies, that series, and he he did a V. But persons unknown, I interviewed him for them. It's a lost recording. <laughs> but he was like, I think he maybe even done the pilot and did some of those when it was trying to. It was a new paradigm of how they made it and sold it. But since then, he did thirteen on leverage, including the one with um, Brent and Armin, right? It was a kind of a celebrity, you know. But he did 13 on Leverage. He did three on Castle, and one of which I did see called The Fast and the Furious, I think. But it was hysterical because they did one scene especially. And this is where I think his sense of humor, which everybody always talks about, will be famously. And if you yeah. go back and watch the blog post I did on, on Trekland with him, I put a – we talked about it. Inset. But he's got one where, you know, Castle and the two, and the two cops, the two main, you know, detectives – they're having to go, and they find some. They think they're finding a killer, and they go, and it's an old lady, and they're kind of stuck there. So they're already kind of awkward, and she makes them sit down, and she just old ladies them, and she's a crazy cat lady, and she's got like a million cats. <laughs> and there's this hysterical scene where they're all sitting there with their bulletproof vests on her sofa with teacups, and there's like cats climbing all over them. And it's just a wonderful – I just remember watching it. Like, oh, that's the most hysterical image I've seen. And it's like, who's directing this one? Frakes. Oh, my God. You know, there was no Star Trek, uh, you know, stunt cast. You know, Brent wasn't in it. You know, Marina wasn't in this episode. It was just straight ahead thing. But I just thought, well, there's he, you know, when he wants to pull out the whimsy, he sure can. So, you know, he did. He's done several episodes of several other series because so he became a regular that was known to the. He did five on Burn Notice. Um, he did an Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. in 2013. Yeah. Uh, I'm just, you know, looking here. Then yeah. he's done six on NCIS LA, which freaked him out because they shoot on eight and nine. And I remember, oh, wow. I remember him talking to me about <laughs> how it was weird to be walking around on eight and nine, and they've and they've remodeled it and they've spiffed it up, and it looks way differently than it did when they were there. But I mean, there's planters and plants outside. But that was a that was a <laughs> weird one. And then he's done some some things since then. Um, and the librarians is his current show, you know, which he yeah. Uh, He's a producer on as well. Yeah, the librarians, right, right, right. After doing the TV movies, he's done right. um, eight of these. So, yeah, 
Yeah, I mean, it's great that he's he's still working, you know, and I mean, I think, you know, that that idea of like him not being sort of like wanting to, to, to force his personal style onto things, but, you know, do whatever mm-hmm. is required of him, you know, makes sense when you're a television director and and he seems to be really good at it, especially considering the fact that he's in such high demand, you know? Yeah. So it's yeah. Cool. I did, I'm I like sorry, it. I didn't get back to that point. But what you were saying, John, was what I started to say was exactly when you don't come in with that auteur's, you know, whatever right. whoop de doo. You come in and and people appreciate that you don't come in with. I mean, you they want you to have a brain and have your own ideas. But when you're willing to be, you yeah. know, a changeling or you're willing to adapt and be a chameleon and and come into the family. And then put your own stamp on it and go from there without coming in demand because that's what TV is. You're the director is the guest guy, not the you know movies. You're the, the 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 lead guy. But in TV, you have to be flexible and come, especially on a series, or else the the crew and the cast will quickly let it be known that, you know, we don't need <laughs> at least the first time or two. We don't need you know stuck up sticky meats here. We <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we Python people. Yeah, but um, but you know, and then after a while, but it's but then after you've done one or two or three or four. You have that just like you would in any situation. When people know you, then you can, you know, you can spread your wings a little bit and maybe do a little bit more. And they and people appreciate it then. But you know, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's cool. It's cool. You know, I mean, who who knows what the future holds? You know, mm-hmm. I mean, but if he were to come on and 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 direct an episode or two of Discovery, I think that would be pretty awesome. You know, I mean, they're getting everyone else back from from the good old days. Uh, why why not Frakes as well? You know. Well, and the good thing is this is a show, since Brian started it, on top of everything else we talk about, what's the concept and the format and who's going to work on it, the other thing is the attitude. And when you have people involved from, you know, who, it's like the new teacher, it's like the new football coach or basketball coach. When they come in, the toughest job in the world is when the guy who was there 40 years retires or the woman who was there 40 years and retires or 20 years and was a legend. The hardest thing in the world is coming in for that because half the time people want to come in and be their own person and, you know, throw all that off and da da da. But the smart people are the ones who come in and they have enough, uh, what's not the word, self confidence, but they have enough, you know, protect, they have enough ego that's the good kind of ego where they can embrace all that, not run away from it. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. and when a production crew comes into Discovery embracing, not just giving it lip service, but embracing, you know, with Nick Meyer and with Joe Minoski and Kirsten Beyer, who's way too imbued in the novels and what she's done with can't, you know, she's oh her canon cred is out there. She can't hide it, like the yeah. like the fans who managed to get hired the first year of Next Generation, or God forbid, even on the first JJ movie. No, no, I'm not a fan at all. No, no, I'm not a fan. <laughs> I'm safe. I'm safe. You know, when they're going to embrace that, then they should be wide open to having. Jonathan Direct. They're going to make a point of having, you know, the hot directors or the really good quality working directors. But then Jonathan is one. But, you yeah. know, but but they can appreciate and and beyond it just being stunt stunt directing casting. <laughs> you know. No, it's not yeah, I mean that's that's he yeah. that's his thing. That, that's his job, you know. He's yeah. he would be someone who was considered yeah. even if he wasn't, you know. I mean, yeah, it's, 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 it seems like a perfect fit yeah. to me. I, but I mean, I this, really Discovery's DNA, production DNA, is not where, oh, no, we don't want any, we, we obviously know that's not the case. You know, we don't, yeah, we yeah. don't want anyone yeah. from the old Star Trek because they all failed, <laughs> because they all ended, so they're obviously failures, <laughs> you know. That, that, but that attitude, you know, <clears throat> that yeah. attitude exists out there, so. Sure, sure it does, yeah. All right. Well, very exciting. Well, so so Larry, what have you got going on? You got Portal Forty Seven, and 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 what? We what, yeah, what we is, just is we happening? had the first anniversary of Portal Forty Seven, and uh, I'll just throw this out there. If anybody's interested in this, I'm about to launch my premium level of Portal Forty Seven called Deck One. But if you if you Ooh. don't know about regular Portal Forty Seven, mm. it's like a mini con all year long, where no savvy fans gone before. So even if you're an old fan, new fan, bored fan, or a fan that has no idea how much Star Trek is really still out there that you don't know about. That's what Portal 47 is for. And uh, we are, I promise you guys, we are starting to work and edit on Con of Wrath. All right. My documentary is awesome. happening. And uh, some conventions coming up and another library tour in Michigan, of all things. You never know. Talk, speak about it, You never know where life's going to go. Um, but, you know, excited this 30th anniversary of Next Gen. That's happening. 
Uh, just got come back from the Sci-Fi Ball in the UK. That's great. And uh, if we have any European listeners out there, uh, if I can get uh, back to Portal 47, if I can get six Europeans, Brits, Germans, whatever, um, we will do a special telebriefing session every month just for you all. So it's in your prime time and not three in the morning like it like it would fall now. <laughs> so Portal47.net if you're not familiar with all the, the goodness of Portal 47. But I'm, I'm really happy. I'm really – when people say, my God, I never knew that or I never knew that person existed or I had no idea. And all these years of trying to figure out a way to get what I feel like I can bring to Trek better, even though I love being on the podcast, much less – conventions and you know being interviewed and doing interviews it all seems like it's in slow motion to me so i you know the years are going by and there's so much that's there and that's what i enjoy about about doing that that's why portal 47 is so fulfilling and gratifying to me and the fact that it's actually like a paying thing on top of that is great too but but i just it's kind of a new (laughs) paradigm and it's kind of interesting to talk about it to people but once they the the, the, the guys and gals that are in now are are wonderful and uh, are evangelizing for me but oh and i need to start reminding everybody this year it's the off year for our big la to vegas geek nation tours film location trek tour that uh, geek nation tours terrace cassidy and i do every other year but this is the year if you're headed to Vegas anyway, if you're going to Star Trek Las Vegas in August, this is the year that we offer the one-day tour the day before on Con Eve, only it's early in the morning. <laughs> so about six, seven hours, we go out to the Valley of Fire, or it's the Kirk Memorial Tour, as I call it. But anyway, that's at the Geek Nation Tours website if you're interested in that. Please give it a look. It's a great way to take a taste of what the big tour is like, or you know, just add to your Vegas adventure if you're there already. Aside from that, we're working on the dock, and um, the plan is for me to launch something new at mid-year with a name in Star Trek that mm. you've heard before. But I won't Ooh. say anything more about it till we get further along with it, but that's the plan. So it was going to be around the time Discovery launched, but who knows when that's going to be. So <laughs> yeah. we're pushing ahead. Yeah, don't tie yourself yeah, down we're pushing that. ahead. <laughs> so that, and I want to give a shout out also to Enterprise in Space, which is the nonprofit that I work with, which is moving along, even though it hasn't had the biggest, for whatever reasons, the biggest profile, but we're applying for grants and a lot of things are moving along, all the technical and all the education reach out because it's going to put 100 or more students projects from around the world in orbit on the first real spaceship called Enterprise um, in 2021 cool. now as a, as a project of the National Space Society. And donations, it's a crowdfunded too, so you can start with $20, and that's at enterpriseinspace.org. It's tax deductible for Americans or whatever amount you give. And, um, yeah, and I'll be talking, talking about EIS all this year and summer as well as whatever else is happening with me. And I've probably forgotten something, but that's okay. My column is still in the paper, Star Trek magazine, if anybody is still reading that. And I hope you are, because it's still, it's still a cool thing. Oh, yeah, yeah. Anytime <laughs> I see it in, in, uh, yeah. in, in the one bookstore which still exists uh, in, <laughs> in the city, I'm like, oh, my God. So, it's yeah. still there. Exciting stuff. <laughs> yeah. So, so if, if people are, are looking for you on the Internet or whatever, where's the best place to find you? Uh, the hub is still LarryNimichek.com, which launched with a new face a few couple months ago. So everybody check that out. Um, everything else, ConnorRath.com, Portal47.net has their own pages. But you can get to everything at LarryNimichek.com or at LarryNimichek on Twitter. And now uh, LarryNimichek's Trekland on Instagram. Yay, me, for joining the 21st Century. Ooh. And... Um, and then Facebook is Larry Nimichek's Trekland. And if you're a collector, Connor, uh, a Trekland trunk is where I put set plans and draft scripts and things out for people to get a hold of. Get them out of my boxes and get them out in the world on Facebook. Cool. Facebook. Well, awesome. Well, well, thank you very much for, for joining us. You know, we always really appreciate it, you know, getting this insight yeah. into uh, the making of, of the Star Trek. And uh, anytime you want to come back, we'd love to have you. Guys, it's been real. It's I, you know, since Chris has been down and hopefully is going to be back soon with us, it's my Trek FM output has dripped off a little bit, but this has been fun. And like I said, I love what you've done with the place. Well, that was fun having Larry on to talk about Jonathan Frakes. I, I don't know. I, I don't know how he keeps everything in his head like that. It, it's it's amazing. It is amazing. He is a he is a walking Trek library. Yeah, I mean, when you think about it, he really had like 
the best job in the world where he basically <laughs> got to hang out on the sets of Star Trek for like the glory years. I mean, oh, come yeah. on. Yeah. You know, I've I've always wanted because whenever we talk to him, he always drops like some piece of information where I'm just like, "Wait, what?" You know, and it just blows mm-hmm. my mind. Like, how did I not hear about that 25 years ago, you know? So I've always thought it would be fun to have him on the show and just be like, "Okay, Larry, blow our mind. Give us some bit of info about some behind the scenes person who worked on Star Trek that no one has ever heard before." You know? Yes. So Maybe we can get him on. Maybe we can get on to do that at some point. So. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk him into it. Well, it's been fun talking about Jonathan Frakes today, but that's not all we're talking about here on Trek FM this week. So here's a look at what you may have missed elsewhere on the network. Previously on Trek FM, Standard Orbit. It was kind of a, a creepy, scary, very intense episode i really like this episode because it pulls you in and it seems very realistic and so so you, you I, I like mary. when it does it you're, you're a mary, like mary fan yeah I like so mary, mary was one of the ones i i was kind of jokingly referencing where it's like well you know if you leave this one out of the rotation it's not really gonna hurt anybody oh i definitely uh, thought you meant the next one no <laughs> well maybe so earl gray and there's these 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 spooky aliens and like they look like ferrets and they're fighting and like Picard is like possessed by this like thunder and lightning and the crew are like gonna have a like are gonna go up against him but they're like no we gotta respect the law man and it's like that you know if you respect the law someone will end up being a cloud man you know to the journey what would you have done well I'd have like programmed my tricorder open the door lob it in shut the door quick <laughs> Try that first of all. So you would does, lob a tricorder probe. Hope it into the doesn't holiday. break as yeah. it lands. Well, you could wrap it in like some gaffer tape or something. Some bubble wrap. The six oh two club. And that feels like a, a turning point in the movie where they seem to go toward this moral of the story that they even repeated at the end, which is, you know, don't be so busy trying to make a life that you forget to participate in the present of where you are. And that's what else is happening on Trek.fm. Check out these shows and discover what we're talking about in your favorite corner of the Star Trek universe. You'll find us wherever you get your podcasts. If you're an Apple user, be sure to hit the subscribe button. That helps us out greatly and makes it easier for other listeners to find the show as they search iTunes. If you're not an Apple user, we've got you covered as well. You can find our shows on Stitcher, TuneIn, SoundCloud, Windows Phone, and of course you can stream and download the MP3 file from our website and grab the RSS link as well. We would like to thank our associate producers, Norman C. Lau, Jeff Sutter, and Chris Steftenagel. Uh, If you want to be like Norm, Chris, and Jeff, head on over to Patreon.com. You can help us keep all of our shows coming to you each week by becoming a patron of the network over on Patreon. If you visit Patreon.com slash TrekFM, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash TrekFM, you'll find our current goals and different milestone contribution levels along with all the great perks we have for you. These perks include early access to content, exclusive content, producer credits, seats on our content development team, and more. We really appreciate any support you can give us and hope you'll join the team. Again, you'll find all the details at patreon.com slash trekfm. If you want to contact us, you can find us on Twitter at trekfm or on Facebook at facebook.com slash trekfm. Facebook is also where you'll find the Babel Conference. Just type the Babel Conference, that's B-A-B-E-L, into the search field on, on Facebook, and it'll come up. John, where can people find you on the internet? Look for Kessel Junkie on your social network of choice. Look for me co-hosting Words with Nerds with my pal Craig. And then over on uh, the Nerd Party Network, I'm co-hosting Aggressive Negotiations with Trek FM's own Matthew Rushing, where we explore some of the stranger aspects of the Star Wars galaxy. And then there's another show that I do on the Nerd Party Network uh, with you, Mike, called Great Shot Kid. Uh, where we explore the work of Star Wars creators, much like we do on this show. So where can people find you online? Well, you can find me right there, or you can find me on uh, my website, commentarytrackstars.com, where I do commentary track stars. And you can also find me on Twitter at mumbles3k. All right. 
so that's it for this week. Next week we're going to continue the uh, the Jonathan Frakes love fest yes. with a look at his first non Star Trek movie, Clock Stoppers. 